Hello, you're listening to Wartime Memories, recorded recollections of the First World War by veteran William Henry Coleman. I'm Robert Crichton, and I'm your host for the next 50 minutes as we explore these recordings with William's grandson, Alan Scott. Since we first released these recordings last year, we've done some more research to build a fuller account of William's war experiences. This is Alan Scott, his grandson, talking about how the recording came to be made. My brother has been involved with the Little Theatre at Leicester for many, many years, and they were in process of doing a production of Oh, What a Lovely War. And he asked my grandfather, the Queen Mary's chocolate tins that were issued to the troops in Christmases at, towards the end of the First War, what did they look like? And we were not sure whether Grandpa would actually answer, because he was very reluctant, as most of his generation were, to actually talk about that period of time. And it just started him talking. And after about two or three minutes, my father and myself tiptoed out of the room, picked up a small battery-powered cassette machine with an inbuilt microphone, which explains the poor quality of the recording, and stuck it on a chair underneath the table. And we ended up with something like three-quarters of an hour of recorded material. Because I've got some OS maps of France and Belgium, mm. 1914 vintage. Oh, yeah? Yes. I wanted to have a good no. look at them, Alan. Yeah. You know that? Yes, I've got some different... Um... William Henry Coleman was born in Lambeth on the 14th of August, 1897. His father, Harry Coleman, was a harness maker working for Southern Railway, and William followed in his footsteps, working as a saddler and leather worker for a firm in Bermondsey. By the time the war began, not only was he still too young to join up, but he would have been exempt, as he was classed as a munitions worker, making gumbuts and other leather items, making it a reserved occupation. That didn't stop him from trying to join up anyway. Grandpa knew that he was below age for signing up right at the beginning, uh, so he took a pen and a razor blade to his birth certificate and tried to fudge it so that it looked like he was a couple of years older than he was. Uh, he didn't get away with it. The recruiting people spotted it. What did you tell me that before you were old enough you went to try and enlist in a somebody's private In a private cavalry. Now, who was that? Now you've done me. I went to uh, a big office in uh, the grand buildings going up from Charing Cross to Trafalgar Square. Yes. Got me? Yes. The Colonial Institute, would it be? Might have been. I think it was the Colonial Institute. Mm -hmm. And they said, I don't doubt you're capable of this, but I'm afraid you're too young for the job. Mm. Otherwise, I'll do private regiment. Mm. Why, why, what was the advantage of that? It was a private Irish regiment. There was, was the pay better, or? All right, wasn't it? I don't know. They were all toffs. Mm. Well, how much did you change your birth certificate for? The best part of a year, really. <laughs> so I knew what that? I was doing. I was in a, I was in safeguarded <laughs> works, you see. Yeah. But we won't last very long. I thought, well, I've got to get in, and uh, I got my letter of exemption from the firm, you see, oh. the end of all Which firm? Oh. Oh, the firm I was working for in Bermondsey. The details of much of William's war record are hard to pin down. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get definitive records because his was one of the military records that disappeared in the Blitz. We believe that William joined up very shortly after his 18th birthday in 1915 and underwent basic training on Salisbury Plain. There, his abilities were underestimated by a sergeant major. And uh, well, I joined. Went down to Salisbury. And sergeant major broke with me. Said, Anybody tradesman here? Old Harry Wallace, step forward. Mm -hmm. Me? I'll pay you more. Said, what do you do? Where do you come from? Yeah. Told him. All right, sir. Report the saddler shop in the morning. You see what the staff sergeant said about me. I said, well, no, what can I do about this, sir? I had a good look around the shop, a proper workshop, and I watched them people performing, making a thread. I know it was like cake here. <laughs> so uh, I fumbled about with a thread, and the old sergeant looked at me, and he must have said, I don't know when you pull in one or not. They said, Can you make that? I had to try. So, oh. So I'll see what you can do. He said, I picked you like the rest. Oh, I should do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said, 
after a bit, I lost patience. I started with Stitty, you know. Yeah. I'd been working peace work in London. <laughs> <laughs> I made rifle bats. I made everything. Riding bridles and reins and you name it. You know they put, they put the rifles on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I made those, all that sort of thing in there, peace work. Oh, you know, it's Government nice. contracts, eh? So I have no shot to do it and I've lost myself, you see. She you bugger, he says, you've been pulling my leg. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, you see, yeah, I'll give a good report. He says, you'll have to come in. <laughs> so from then, oh, you've got me bit. After this trade test, William was appointed as a saddler within the Royal Field Artillery. An RFA battery would have had a full strength of 198 officers and men, including two saddlers. We now believe that William was part of the 156th Battery, part of the 33rd Division of the New Army. They were posted to France in November 1915 and remained on the Western Front until the end of the war. Well, that was that. I was posted as Sather to Redmond. Then they said, now you're going to rise. You'll be two and a half weeks instead of a shilling. Oh, well, that's, that's, a rise. Rise. that's a hell of a rise, isn't it? You send all the money home to me. Yeah. At the time, a private soldier's pay was one shilling per day, about a third of the average civilian wage, although a soldier didn't pay for rations and lodgings. As a saddler, William received a trade supplement of tuppence halfpenny extra. So, so you started off, you went to, to Salisbury. Um, when did you know, after for your that? basic training. Yeah. Basic. And then when did you go? You went I never fired a rifle, boy. Yeah. No fear, they go bang. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I did. I used to see Vince Adler. I used to go out with him, always prepared for breaking. We got all the kit and everything. And uh, we got galloping all around Lark Hills, Stonehenge, all around there. And uh, the only thing we had on the wagon, at the bit behind the horse, is the first one. Now you've got the gun the next one, perhaps, mm -hmm. or ammunition. Oh, you throw the ammunition with him, that's what I mean. Um, he used to sit on there. I believe he had a blanket, I'm not sure, across the top, straight mm -hmm. on. Got, you've got six horses and three men mm -hmm. up there, and you don't do it, see? Um, you're galloping across this grass plain. A bloody driver, so I said, still there, boy? You know, what? Good. <laughs> <laughs> All you had was a hand leer like that, and another idea between your legs. <laughs> and if you shot off, there's a two ton of iron work. <laughs> <laughs> with a cannon. With a cannon. <laughs> so you fucking still there. <laughs> Whoa! Pull them all in like that. Go have some fun with it, you. <laughs> Better than the living you were in your Yeah, life. I'm telling me. <laughs> I could run down the field then with a truss of hay, I'll be back. I have a feeling that this recording happened after we'd been out for a lunch to celebrate their gold, their diamond wedding anniversary. So we're looking at, you know, September 81, mm. possibly the recording. But it, it was just one of these odd things that a generation who'd never actually talked about family history mm. or their own personal history, in part through the customary reticence and in part through probably the trauma in there that they didn't want to relive and suddenly just from a few odd questions the floodgates opened and my father and myself who were, we knew that we were recording I'm not sure who else spotted that we got the machine there but we therefore decided not to try and structure it as a Q&A or anything like yeah. that because I think that would have killed it. In the next section William had an encounter with an Irish major we believe we can now affirm this was Major Stud, also of the 156th Battery. When we had an Irish Major join us, Major Stud, perfect gentleman, uh, he brought his own horses from Ireland. Then when he went home on leave, he was taken back with them bring two more. Mm -hmm. He said for his groom one and groom one here. He said, uh, came to my little shambles, whatever it was, I don't know what it was, on the ground, I expect. He says, uh, in future, he will tender all accounts to the officer in question and he will settle his account like a gentleman. Thank you very much, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> he came home broke. He came home broke. <laughs> oh, well. The Irish Major went on to have a long career in the Army. As a gentleman cadet, he graduated from Sandhurst as a second lieutenant 
and was promoted to Major by the end of the war. Major Studd was mentioned in dispatches, was awarded the Military Cross on the 1st of January 1917, and was awarded a DSO in January 1919. He was an aide-de-camp to George VI during the Second World War, and died in 1973. Whilst only mentioned in passing in this recording, we're pleased to be able to expand a little on his life. You did. You didn't bother to save money when you were over there, I shouldn't think. Might have lived long enough to spend it. Might not live long enough to spend it. Might not live long enough to spend it. But they brought their own grooms and that with them, didn't they? Well, army grooms as a rule. Oh, they did bring their servants. I was going to say. Being a saddler, William did a lot of work with horse furniture, but his duties meant that he had to work more closely with the animals themselves. I think probably he was not experienced with them. Mm. You've got to have a horse. <laughs> you've got to have one of them or you're going to have a horse, pony, you know. So as you keep up with the regiment, if they speed. <laughs> all right, all right, me. First, you've got to go to a riding school. They're a nice boy there. You go round in the ring. Right, canter. Oh! You're not bloody old, you'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> America. They're supposed to be broke in. I'm going to kick your eye out. Mm -hmm. All angles. Mm -hmm. God, he knows you. Trying to clean one, he got a twist on his nose and a rope on his leg tied to a peg. Shows you can clean it. You twist another twist of his nose like that, right? And then when you release it, you jump for you. Oh, that was life, then, boy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's certainly done. Most of the horses you have have never been used to it in life like that, have they? Oh, no, the wild ones, all, they were wild too. They were all the cars horses, were And when you've got the mokes, the mules, like the horses, got a bit thin, they're mules. You've got one in his stand, like, looking like nothing on earth. His ears do. <laughs> and then you say, good. Not me, mate. <laughs> and you could push your shut. <laughs> <laughs> no, he said, not going. All of a sudden, he won a boat. <laughs> 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 I used to think of me, so I thought, well, these blokes on the lorries, they don't get the fun with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. No. no, I mean, the lorry drivers out there, yeah. they didn't get the fun with you. He did he did leather work, so he, he would not have been totally phased by seeing a horse. Well, what, what were you doing most of the time during the wall? Mending? Well, I was working. Yeah, mending harness. I was keeping all the, all the harness done. Mending harness well, and, and repairing. Horses, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, would go out, they would go out on manoeuvres or whatever. No, they'd go up the line to, mm -hmm. to work. Yeah. They weren't on manoeuvres there. Uh, but, I mean, say, say a horse got killed, they'd take the harness off it, presumably, oh, if yes, they could, yes. and bring it back. Yeah, and you've got to repair it. And mm -hmm. repair it for the next mm -hmm. They used to break traces, steel traces, and break them, you know? Mm -hmm. They were all covered on the ends of it, they? Yeah. all tires and tires change up, and then there was all the other equipment, bridles and reins and those bags. And How many saddles were there then, Bob? Huh? How many saddles were there? Only ten. Mm -hmm. My mate and I, that's all. The couple who used to mend the boots. Mm -hmm. well, well, he used to mend the boots, and Tony used to be the shoe mm -hmm. but he had a man. You were all together? Were you, were you well, virtually, you were on the same unit. So. Mm -hmm. A pony's mate, chap named Ferrara, he got behind a mule or a horse. And what happened? The horse kicked him. You never seen nothing like it. Ooh. I painted his feet. Really. Oh. I'll tell you what this same pony did. He used to work. He's a real company. He used to work in the Union Gardens Company, meet people. We can be a shooting machine. He was tired to shoe a mule one day. He was on a short, thickish, strong man, very strong. Trying to shoot this mule. They'd done everything but keep his eye out. And uh, he got under the horse's belly and he wrapped his arms round all legs like that. Oh. You long here. Bang! He <laughs> don't roll up and tap him on the floor. Oh, you don't move. Well, what have you got him? What do you think? <laughs> I used to frighten a French, you know. 
see an English show in Smith, of course. Yeah, but it wouldn't look what I did. <coughs> when I show a horse there, I put him in a frame. I tie his head up. Yeah, yeah, it's all right, I go on. Yeah. I tie his head up, then have a stand and put his foot on the tie that on, then the bloke knocks him out. Grab my bloke stick on six while he's been doing one. <laughs> Just catch hold of his foot and we'll put it I mean, uh, um, some of them big horses, you know, they weigh nearly a ton. And they'd, uh, they'd be showing me pick his back leg up and think, man, you need to know, get up your long shoulder, you know. And you think nothing of it. Working with horses meant that William was close at hand during a disastrous part of the fighting at Arras in 1917. Whilst the battle ended with a victory and the ringing of bells, fundamental errors led to a loss of men and horses. But when I was in Arras, <laughs> had a big victory bell ring here, with a victory for Bing of Cambrai. Had a big victory. All the English cavalry was cut to pieces through maladministration. The snowstorm came up. All the cavalry came up. You'll see a sight like in your life. You talk about the guys on the road. The Scots guys, the Lancers, you know, they were all there. We'd been up, with our guns up here, but we were all black horses. I did that. And we cut all the wire, the pieces, see, the shell cross. Clear the deck completely, and nothing could live in it. All the wire was cut the pieces. See, and come on, snow. And the officers were some sort of said, Get them bloody black horses out of here! Mm. On the snow was, see? Yeah. Get them where you like. There's a little broken down village here, so we got in there to watch what shelter we could to get away from observation, you see. Still no cavalry. He been to the after several hours. They arrived. Of course, so in we go, you know. When they got their job, put the wire back. <laughs> you know, them big coils. Mm -hmm. Of course, the horses got tangled up mm -hmm. in the wire. Oh, Goldie was in there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, they got bone, bone down. Mm -hmm. um, just a mate, well, he shelled us all bloody like the gas shells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just for my good pleasure. So of course we've done a fine retreat, <laughs> leaving Jerry where he was, and got back into Arras. But I mean the, the, the story there about they turned up with black horses mm. and the snow on the ground. I mean the military leadership, the brass, mm. the minds of the brass, if one can use it that way, obviously weren't thinking clearly. The men were very practical, making things and providing services to supplement their income. Whilst the ordinary soldier was supplied by the army, Officers had to pay for their own food and were given an allowance to purchase their own uniforms and equipment. This allowance was £50, a thousand days' pay for a private, and fuelled a mini service industry among the men, which William was a part. Well, you could have bought the beer, you'd be the one. What people used to make money. I collected their money while we were up, up there mm. by working, but when we got back, my mate and I, we'd only do and got any, because they'd paid their bills. Well, the only one thing you do, you're going to be sociable, isn't it? they spend it with them. <laughs> well, the, spend it. well, why did they give you the money? What were you doing for them? Well, we made them identity discs. If we ordered no, a letter from ordnance, what we wanted, which they sent. <laughs> what did you tell ordnance you were using it for? No, yeah, all, 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 all the questions, just all of them. I mean, you used to get some on the harvest as well. Yeah, and then, uh, Every chin strap buckle, you know the old thing, that is brass buckle. We get every one of them we could lay our hands on, you see. And uh, the shoe maker we got the brass rivets. They cut up the shell cases for the sheet brass on the bevel edge. New ones, presumably. Huh? New shell cases. Well, old ones. Well, oh. they've been used. Mm -hmm. They're plenty of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had our issue of uh, numerals. Mm -hmm. Then we stamped their name and regiment number on that. And uh, for the chin strap buckle. And we used to charge a franc and a half, well that was, that was ten pence, about fifteen pence. Mm -hmm. Well we used to have lists for paper like that, didn't we? Royal Garrison, Royal Walls, so and so, so and so, so and so, so. Chappy come, you know, told you, yeah, I've made a money on some of them. They bring a list to them. <coughs> then, you know my pocketbook got up to get the pink skin one? Mm -hmm. He's made a pocketbook like that. That's what they say, used to make one. used to make one of them for five francs, well the frank was worth ten pence. Okay. Army leather. Then we find somebody's map case or something like that, for a bit of celluloid, cut out an oval or a square, or whatever it is, 
and insert their photographs and stamps, you see. That was five francs. Uh, so that was what? Belt. That was about four bob, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, four. Ended the belt, money belt. Yeah. Yeah. We used all the basils for that, what they call basils, did yeah. the stuff. Hold them in half, stitch them along the top end, put the buckle and strap on the other end, turn down flat, just half and long. I think I was, uh, I was about a little dear in the pocketbook, but it was much more stitching, you know. So we used to make those. If you polished the office of Sam Brown belt, what did we used to get? About 25 francs for that. The, the officer class are all employing the, the working class to do all the work for. Oh, so and, no and, change and, there. And absolutely no change at all. And, and just shining up a, a, a Sam Brown would be quite a lot of... Um, we used to get about 25 francs for that. And of course Polishing it. Uh, Polishing it. Yeah. So 25, 25 francs or 25 something. They're all bone and beeswax and everything. 25 francs, I should think. Yeah, but 20, and then, of course, 25? we used to make... Uh, so what's the money? Oh, wait, wait a minute, Grandpa, you're saying 25? Oh. Think a quid? Thing. Yeah. 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 Because they pay for their own stuff, they eh, officers. Yeah, so you're saying you, you get a quid again. So, so they quid. got up. Yeah. You got a quid for that. Because yeah, it's against yeah, the, ordinary, working, the ordinary squaddies pay was what? A bob a day? A bob a day. A day, yeah. But you're effectively getting 20, 20 men's pay for yeah, yeah, polishing yeah. that, which would have taken take you a long time. Probably the best part of a day's yeah. work. Then, then we uh, they used to make all their hunting gear, we had to buy all the stones. Mm. It's all the yeah. army stuff, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's army leather. Oh, yeah, of course it was. Who else were they going to get it? Reliner, <laughs> reliner riding saddle, which you're very pleased, of course, that was. I couldn't get one down anywhere else. But were they hunting over there? No, there's all there's the hunting equipment here. What to bring back home? No, no, no. For their home and for the horses. So they, they found time to hunt when No, they no, home. no, that was the gear they wore. They didn't wear army army regulation harness. Oh, they wore private. Oh special yeah. oh, I special yeah. harnesses. Oh, yeah. oh, I must have just made it up. Silver plated buckles and all that sort of thing. <laughs> this is a bit of personal pride, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was yeah. the officers yeah. used to be able to bring up the cap in here with all the ones. Then the Martin Glow, you get so much for Martin Glow. That's the strap that comes up round the horse's belly, bring the front legs. Comes up the front with a medallion yeah. or something like that, mm -hmm. splits, yeah. and then goes up to his head where the reins come through. That's yeah. something he's head going to. Who used to get? Well, I don't know what he's got. When you were talking about pocketbooks, identity tag mm. holders, you are probably talking about a piece of le leather which is maybe six inches square max. Mm. Now, if you visualise how a saddle is made, you are using pieces of leather which are probably going to be two or three foot square so what are you doing is you probably a lot of this will be done in fact from the offcuts from what would effectively be waste material because yeah. leather is not something you can recycle all you can do is use the scraps yeah. Yeah. and i certainly remember as a child having bookmarks which grandpa had made from leftovers yeah feather airman tom's name that was his bitch. he used to make coal scuttles that was his side one but showcase cut it down and put a little loop on the back, make it a shovel, sort of safe on, bullets. <laughs> then they asked where you got them from. You know. <laughs> 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 and sold the bullets on the bottom for leg. I sold them. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, you didn't bring anything like that home. Right. Oh, no, I made that big skin map case, didn't I? Yes. I made that out And the cribbage board. And my shaving glass. Yeah. I the made that big out. skin That's came so off that trinket you had. No, I had to block the dead off stuff. Got the pigskin? The leather. Oh, the leather. And his, his graphs still are all in front of it. Yes. Oh, they'll be right near the neck there. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a nice bit of pigskin. Hmm. <laughs> but what about the cribbage board, Pop? Oh, I found that in a little village called Bursary. That oh, was I on thought fire. you'd made it, mate. That oh, was on fire when I got that. Oh. I also got a pheasant eyed waistcoat from that place. A what? Pheasant eyed patterned waistcoat. Oh, it's beauty, that place. <laughs> it yeah. He walked up in front of him. <laughs> we, we entered the place, and don't you? It's not a large village. All the street uh, pole lamps, you know what the lamps are going, yeah. or telegraph poles, they were all, all burning, but the Germans are set like each one of them, because we put them out. Them. And uh, we came to one of these places, and think of a cellar full of little potatoes. Of course, they'll win the fire in the winter potatoes. They'll up their lamps. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, oh, God, I've done a bit more scouts and I found this old cribbage board. Of course, I'm near the end of all of us, but I marked it in 1918. Mm. 
and, uh, and then I found a nice place, it was a bit chilly, and there was a little pleasant, <laughs> pleasant eyes all over the world, but we were very deep the behaviour of any army throughout history, going back to time immemorial. And to a certain extent, whether you describe it as looting or whether you describe it as salvage, because from the sounds of it, it was a, it was a burning building, therefore nothing would have been left. I, the impression I got, actually, of the story of the pigskin map case was oh, that, in fact, it wasn't a made item. He found it. It was basically the property of a dead man and possession nine points of the law. I think we get a, a little bit more about um, finding things in the in the rubble. So, yes. Um... Then we went into civilian occupation. There's no civilian to go. And we picked the house we were going to live in, which finally got the best decor of furniture. <laughs> and our piano was a bit flat. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to mosey round up the road and found a better one. <laughs> we changed them over. <laughs> Anyway, we could all establish nicely with this piano and a ding dong and bang at the door of the military police. Did you know you're liable for looting? <laughs> <laughs> so what, you had to How did they know? So what, you had to trundle the, the other piano back again? Yeah, 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 put it on back. We got our guns up there somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, somewhere, somewhere in that area. We got our guns in position, like a house, if I remember rightly, and we were firing through the wall, you know. And, uh, and something that an officer came along and he brought this old lady with him and I suppose a pass and I suppose I don't remember how. He said, could we, could we move the gun? Well, of course they could, they moved the gun. And the old girl said something about it. They, so they put up this stone or brick or whatever you got there. I promise him he made a fraction there and the boys have been sitting on it. Didn't know. The boys have been sitting on it and didn't know. That was old girl savings there under the floor. They didn't know all them lovely fractions sitting there. No, I mean, Gra Grandpa would turn his hand to whatever needed doing. Mm. Because the treat when I went and saw my grandfather was, oh, can we go and work in the shed? And the warning on that was, yes, but watch those knives, because they're sharp. And his definition of a sharp knife was that you could hold a Rizzler paper up by its edge, bring the knife down across it, and if it didn't go through in a wanna, that knife was not sharp. That's where I learned to respect tools. I'm useless with them, but I got... I learned that respect for them. You look after your tools, they'll look after you. Soldiers were always on the lookout for more food. The daily rations were a pound of preserved meat and bread, a few ounces of cheese and bacon, as well as various meat and veg, with pinches of tea, salt and sugar. Substitutions were frequent and boosted by parcels from home or anything else that might come to hand. Uh, on another occasion we had, uh, what was that for? Something another prize was a pig. Pig? Pig, yeah, young pig. I never seen it, or peg driving, or, you know, gate driving. Something to do with horses, anyway. And anyway, whoever won the pig said that he'd got to be killed and eaten. Of course, our cook, he wasn't much of a cook, but slaughtered the pig and we had roast pork. <laughs> that was done by the old oil drum, mm -hmm. banked up with clay. Oh, yeah. So you could only yeah, do yeah. this when you were back. The old older shot up. Put it, when it got really hot, and they put the joint in. You either got to burn off or you could put it in If you did a, if you did a plate of our custards, you'd been all right. Oh, yeah. We got near one or two dairy farms where they bit quiet. They sold skim milk. So uh, we'd come get some skim milk. We got some custard back, and but we put it on the forge. <laughs> they make good custard. Uh. These, these, were the, these, these, were the, these were the portable forges with the hand, on, the hand winder on the side. Then we soaked a lot of the, our biscuits one day. Got all some prunes or plums or plums from somewhere. It was Christmas. Yeah, it was Christmas that was. We hadn't got any, any rubber ties, but we got some football shorts or something from somebody. Tied all this up and put it in the pot and had a boil up. <laughs> We dumped biscuits and prune for Christmas food. <laughs> if you're carrying meals ready to eat or ration packs, mm. fine. If for some reason they're not available or you get damn bored with them, mm. you forage. Yeah. <laughs> End of story, you know. It's the way it works. Beyond his work as a saddler, William's general duties included delivering rations to the front line. <laughs> Another thing, when I used to, I used to uh, serve their rations out for them, because I not wasn't very early duty, so I went into a job. And I had, what, in my section, about 14, 14, 15 in my section, I suppose. I'd been doing more. And uh, 
I go and get what I've got to have, so much bread, so much cheese, so much butter, so much of this or that the other, then I'm going to cut this lot up into 14 equal proportions, all of it. If it was a loaf, one before you pour, no dog biscuit, no biscuit could have called it a loaf. Eh? Um, yeah. And uh, if you got half a loaf, well, I know you were lucky. But in there, it was quarter of a loaf, and another time with all biscuits. I don't know. And, uh, and the cheese, get them all the right size. And then the Arabs come in from stables. Oh, which is the biggest? <laughs> <laughs> you go and get the tea, get a Dixie tea, it was all ready from the cook. And on top of that was, uh, was his lid for the rashes of bacon in. Because he cooked on the open wood fire and he found it with his hat. His father went down the bed. Well, the cook had cooked the bacon. Or yeah. Yeah. The cook had. I wonder where you cooked the bacon over the floor. Yeah, and you had that round tin with the lid. Yeah. Oh, you got the Dixie in that one with a handle. Yeah. Right? And the lid you used for your bacon. Mm. Right? You put that in there. Then when you finish that, you only got the water washed out of it because it was tight. So you smack that on, but when you had tea next time, you've got a lovely film of going to put it. The grease on the top of it, yeah. <laughs> These are not tiles, is it? No, I know, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. What yeah. I didn't like, I mean, is you have to have a pinch. Because you know the, you know the bell pin? Mm. Yeah. You know the seams? Mm. That's one man. Oh, I know, yeah. Mm. Well, you yeah, have to have a pinch. Oh, all the equipment, they go up on the pole. Yeah, yeah. Now you'll get 14 blokes of Yeah, 14 blokes in a bell tent. We used to have that when I was in the bowl. Scat camp in the old bell tent. Feet to the middle. They've, they've got the centre pole took a fair bit of weight. Ridge tents are what you... But I've been in Atlanta. Hmm. Well, there might be fair goats and all that. All that. Depends what was happening. Hmm. Yeah. Tins and God knows what. I didn't like them. Last man likes them. Last man, he shuts the door. Yeah, but the the thing that resonates in some of the comments I was actually making during this recording, mm. you know, which was certain aspects of it rang very true to me because I was involved with quite a lot of camping at that stage and we were still operating in many of the ways which we'd learned through the Scout movement and those rules had, had been set up originally by Baden-Powell, who mm. was military man of the Boer War mm. period, and things didn't change that much. <laughs> we got in one farm, yeah, we was on the move, we were travelling from place to another, because I wandered about an awful lot of it, and uh, we got Miss Farmyard, and blimey, I've got a lot of chickens here. <laughs> so, well, we were all evil thoughts, a whole lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of chickens here, the old girl came out and she that was all right. We were moving, you know, all the things, you know, we could be bungled it on quick, tied it all up. That went under the wagon. We didn't stop for three days. <laughs> 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 They got a Dixie, mm. big cook, big cooking pot, gallon cooking pot. They put some army grain around it and underneath it, and a stick to just keep the edge off the ground. Chicken goes under pecking for the corn. Take the stick out, one trap chicken. And then it goes horribly wrong. And then it then <laughs> sods law kicks in. I'll tell you this one about Belgium now. Very girls, like already girls. We got in there. It's in a very sticky position. I understood if that was true, there was only four, uh, six guns that was ours between us and the French coast at that time. Mm. We lost two, but we pulled them back. They got a, they got an award for that. They wrapped all the stuff up in sacking, all the rattlers. Went up there and I hit the wagon on them, and away you go sharp. They got two, but we lost two, we lost two, and we got them back, that's right. Well, we was into the farm there, and they'd had to scarf it quick because the Germans had come it. There were all little pigs running about there. Well, funny more, she was with me, that's not for the pork supper, but I'm cool, good on. He said, right. <laughs> he goes to his medium shed, 
Oh, he's your roast pork tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, already, you know, so. <laughs> That's right, the Germans used to come over with their bombers and leave over, lean over the side in the basket. See you tonight! On the mess round, William also had other less pleasant duties. When not delivering food, the mess cart would be collecting and dealing with the dead. One of the worst jobs was, was uh, cooking a long time. When we had a pretty heavy we period. Yeah, I mean, but that to a certain extent was the you know life's rich tapestry mm. bit. You know, basically, as I said before, laconic, fatalistic attitude of it's happened, deal with it, well, so get on with it. William's war lasted a little over three years, from joining up in 1915 till the armistice in 1918, by which time William was in Mons. It was another hard winter, and resources were limited, so the journey back home and the process of demobilisation for the average soldier wasn't an easy one. <laughs> After the war, I'll finish. <laughs> After the war, we got up to Mons, and they said, well, you've been good boys. You can walk all the way back to Deer in the middle of it. <coughs> After the November armistice, right across there from Mons to Deer. Mm -hmm. boy, stopping in broken chateaus. And mm. We burnt some beautiful doors from firewood, big and warm. Yeah. And uh, we got to this place just outside Deer, and we had a Salvation Army man with us. And a uh, man from Tyneside, like me, and old Dick West. We all went down to the local investment department. I suppose we had him up, I don't know, it was all right. We come here home, and we was up in the loft where the rats stole the candles away from me while you're looking, while you're not looking. Then we went on strike, eh? You did, we went on strike. Who did? We just called us. Oh, yeah. I ordered gun drill done. <laughs> like you've been firing them for years. Uh, what? Oh, official them. Discipline. 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 Discipline.
Yeah. That was to get our civilian clothes. Yeah. And uh, to come yeah. in. So I had a suit, or 30 bob, whichever you like. Yeah, 30 bob or a suit. <laughs> I said, I'll have a suit. So, uh, and bugger if they ain't got a strike on me. Really? <laughs> we had to wait a couple of days while I said, we'll just try yeah. before we could get out. What's the strike for that? I don't know. Typically, they have. But I mean, why'd you take them all down from London? Because they give you your gear yeah. up there. Yeah. That one, the depots, you see, for Timor. Yeah. Who's getting discharged? Yes. But I mean, you'd have thought they'd have discharged them in London. It's no different in 1947. Oh, no, I, no. came, I came back from India to Southampton. Mm -hmm. and had to go up to, to Yorkshire to be demobbed and, and kick about for four weeks for some reason or other. But yes, the idea, you, you come into what Charing Cross, you then have to march to Chelsea, you know, to march back to Fenchurch Street, you know, that's not untypical of the military organisation. And then he gets immediately caught in a strike, uh, which is... Yeah, which, uh, would, which I think... Again, a, is also very well, which I think was a civilian strike. Oh. But it, effectively, one, once the armistice has been signed, an awful lot of people would just take their eyes off the ball. Well, after all that we had a strike done, in London, mm. our old call, something rather, right? mm. the original members of the Baptist body was 12. How many mm. were there originally? I don't know, 45. It was 12 the original rest of them. We full strength that whole time. They showed yeah, you how many men went through. Mm. Yeah, but Isn't it? The, the other the 133. But it was a full strength the whole time. Yeah, yeah well, they, uh, no, none of those have been transferred out or. Well, they were replaced many times. They kept replacing all the time. Yeah, but they were the originals. They yeah, but them. all the others have been killed rather than transferred or anything. Yeah, they were out of The whole lot. The last section of the recording is of particularly poor quality, as the background noise breaks through a lot of what is said. The family gathering is breaking up, dishes being cleared away, and William starts to talk more generally before the tape runs out. Here he tells of an incident at La Panne on the Belgian coast. On the Belgian coast, his name was Prima Vera. Down the basement, there's less chance of getting those things dropped on you. If you went down the corner of the bay, you got machine guns, so you didn't go around the corner. But do you know, the pen, you've been to the pen, do you know there were string orchestras playing and people dancing? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's so good, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> as our trunk pulled in, so we had part of the Jewish chimney pot off the railway station. That was the first yells they'd had in the morning. So we were in a rare time, so we stopped there. Mate. What happened was, they thought it was going to be a big offensive in that side. You know? They thought it was going to be quite a lot of guns and things too. Of course, we started banging them out there. You know? And of course, the waters only had to be just down, didn't it? The time we visited the dirty great lake. <laughs> the shells laying about like silver on the ground. They're so fast. They slid if they didn't go up, slid all up the top of the sand. Mm. That's because it's an incredibly fine sand, isn't it? It does look like a dirty great lake. We shall find it. Did anybody realise that water? Oh, you don't expect all them brass hats to get into that problem, did you? Uh, oh, you'd be surprised with these snakes, don't we? Uh, I mean, anybody knows that. It's probably common sense because your instructions was to. You mustn't dig down more than two feet when you build a dugout. You mustn't build more than two feet. Two feet, two feet of sand, right? And that was where the tape ran out. And that's where the tape ran out. <laughs> and one of the sad things in some ways is I think Grandpa only got back to France once or maybe twice during the succeeding 60 plus years of his life for a variety of reasons but he still maintained a knowledge and some fluency of in the French language. Um, I certainly remember him bumping into a couple of young French girls in Lavenham. This would have been in the 
maybe in the late 60s, maybe in the 70s, and being able to hold a very reasonable conversation with them in a combination of their sort of schoolgirl English and his schoolboy oblique army French. So are there any last things you'd like to say about listening back to the recording? And uh, It's been an interesting experience listening back to it. I'm, I hadn't listened to it myself for a long, long time. I just wish that we'd been able to do something more structured at the time. But as I say, it was a quite an effort to get Grandpa to talk about that period because yes. his attitude was, mm, don't really want to know about it. After the war, he returned to London. He married my grandmother, Elsie Beatrice Neat, in September 1921 in Clapham. He then worked in the London area for the rest of the 20s and I believe into the early 30s. He had his own business towards the end of that time, I think, as a coach trimmer. But that was a victim of the Depression and... I'm not sure whether he relocated his business to Colchester or he moved to Colchester to find work after the collapse of the business. But certainly from the late 30s until the 70s, he was working with a company long gone now in Colchester who were coach trimmers. And I remember going to see him and he was working on upholstery, tonneau covers and the like for a variety of what I then perceived as being posh cars. They were probably cherished cars in many cases. There were things like Rolls Royces, but also other mainly pre-war open touring cars, that sort of thing. He and my grandmother got through to their diamond wedding anniversary and he died in the second quarter of 1982. I haven't got to know the exact date, but it was on Grand National Day. He'd seen, he'd watched the race on the television in the afternoon gone upstairs and didn't come down. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I think I should ask that minister. I can be going on. That's interesting. Go on and talk forever on this love. You've been listening to Wartime Memories, presented by Robert Crichton. Many thanks are due to Alan Scott for talking about his grandfather and sharing this recording. But we'll let William have the last word. You could have them dishing out to run, Mark. <laughs> They're good. I think they you could have eight or nine of them standing on all over their mouths open, so we just eight or two to run in. Next one in, next one in. <laughs>